Hello, this is Candidate Conversations. I'm Nick Gibson, a local government reporter for the Spokesman Review, and I'm here today to speak with Rob Chase, a Republican candidate for a representative position in Washington's 4th Legislative District. Rob, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. Um, We've been starting these conversations just by having the candidates kind of make their pitch to the voters. Uh, So why should voters uh, elect you this November? I have a lot of experience. This is my, um, I believe, my 10th race. (laughs) So I started, uh, I ran the first time in the year 2000, and first couple times I uh, ran as a libertarian. So my first uh, person I ran against was Bob McCaslin, senator out there in the 4th District. And um, we actually hit it off pretty good. He became one of my mentors, and I'm good friends with his uh, son, uh, Bobby McCaslin. And uh, then I ran against George Nethercutt in 2002, uh, again as a libertarian. I didn't even know how to get connected to a major party, but I liked a lot of the libertarian ideas, you know, smaller government and free markets. And uh, But I, I was really against um, the war in Iraq, and I thought someone had to say something. And uh, so I ran against him, and I, I said, well, you know, it's going to be a big mistake and to go into Iraq. It's going to be um, like Vietnam all over again. And... Uh, and in retrospect, I think I was right. It was a big waste of uh, lives and money. And uh, you know, and I, I think of like uh, George Washington and Jefferson saying, you know, don't go out seeking monsters to destroy. And you know, with the amount of money, you know, that, that spent, not to mention maybe a million people were killed during that thing. And you know, now it's out of sight and out of mind. People have forgotten it, but not the people who lost um, family in that, either here or in Iraq. Uh, or Afghanistan, for that matter, too. So, you know, we need to uh, really think about what we're doing, do some critical thinking, thinking for ourselves and not just join the crowd and um, and the hoopla that's going on. And that's the, what you hope to bring to Olympia, if elected? Yeah, I think I, I really do believe in critical thinking. That's thinking for yourself, so I call them as I see them. And generally, I will say I, I'm, I'm conservative, but I... If someone can prove me wrong, and one, once in a while they have, then I will I will change my vote to do that. So I've crossed the uh, boundary a few times, but um, generally I do like um, still some of the libertarian values. In fact, um, Ro- I think Ronald Reagan said something to the effect that the uh, soul of the uh, Republican Party is libertarian. But there are factions within the Republican Party, and uh, my you know, I, I was county treasurer for eight years, and, uh, you know, I was t- told, don't run. You can spend $50,000. You're still not going to win. Well, I ran in the primary, got 2%, so I went into second place, top two forward, and I won in the general. So that was something I never really expected to happen to me. But, you know, I wanted to get in there and uh, shake things up. And uh, and I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of people think, well, you got to be a CPA to run for county treasurer. But not really. You've got CPAs that work for you. And I had a CPIM, which is Certified in Production and Inventory Management, shop for floor control. And that helped me a lot more in that position I think, than I think of you know, being a CPA would have. So um, I think in eight years, we made some big changes. And I did some, uh, along with Mike Voltz, my deputy treasurer, you know, we got some really good things. And, you know, one of the big ones took 10 years to do once we started it. And we were fighting our own Treasurer's Association to get this passed, but that was allowing partial payments any amount, any time for people who got behind in their in their property taxes. And once once it got to the floor after three years, it passed unanimously. And then the other one was um, we wanted to get rid of the usurious penalties on property tax. And uh, lo and behold, I got, once I did run for legislature, I got on the Finance Committee, and we never could get it through the Finance Committee before. And the chair of the finance committee um, at that time, Representative Noel Frame, now she's a senator, thought, well, that's a good idea. Let's get rid of these usurious penalties. So we did. So, uh, And then when it got to the floor, Mike Voltz helped it get to the floor. He'd made allies on the Democrat side. And um, it, it once again, it passed unanimously. So I think that's probably, uh, in my political life, that's the best achievement I've gotten done. Well, I appreciate you touching on, on some of your experience. That's one of the things I had hoped to explore for the voters. Um, You know, you had held this seat from 2020 to 2022. Mm -hmm. Um, You've also, as you mentioned, run for several offices at the federal, state, and local level. 
Um, so what is it about this position in particular that made you want to run this year? Well, I, I enjoyed it. The problem with 2020 to 2022 was during COVID. Uh, I refused to take the vaccination. I didn't feel good about it. And uh, so I only got to be on the floor for five minutes <laughs> to see where I sat Very at the very end with, with sign E. Die. And so the first year I'd never left Spokane, you know, I was in my office that I have here and then uh, everything was on Zoom. And then I did get to go to Olympia uh, the second year, the 60 day session, but I wasn't allowed to leave my room in the John L. O'Brien building where my office was. So, uh, but still you got to stand up for principles. I think that the, um, I was a lot more worried about the uh, vaccine than the virus. And I think um, time will show that I was right because you have to represent uh, the people. I heard a lot of horror stories of, about what happened with the vaccines. I mean, they're, uh, the problem is that um, uh, these stories are, uh, oh, they're, they're not allowed to be printed. And, uh, and I think that's one of the big things I see is um, people, uh, you know, they don't have the freedom of speech, you know. The, um, there's a lot of wonderful doctors who said, you know, the vaccines are causing more harm than the virus itself, and they were defrocked, you know. So what are they going to get out of telling, saying that, you know, they're just going to suffer for it? And then the same thing, of course, I admire Robert Kennedy, who was in the Democrat Party, but then uh, he kind of got booted out for <laughs> questioning the vaccines. I read his book. The role of Anthony Fauci, I'm probably the only person in the legislature that actually read it, but it's very well documented. And I think um, he said on an interview the other day, there's probably like a realignment of the parties because you see uh, these people getting behind Trump, Robert Kennedy and Tulsi Gabbard, Leon Musk, Elon Musk and Joe Rogan. And, uh, but yet on the, the mainstream Republican side, you see... Um, Oh, the McCain's and the Romney's and the Bushes and uh, Cheney's all getting, they're endorsing Kamala. So I think there is kind of like a new thing that's happening, um, and we'll find out after this election how far that's going to go. Yeah, only a couple weeks left at this point. Yeah. Um, you brought up the vaccine, and uh, that's an area where um, your opponent, Ted Cummings, has criticized some of your thoughts. And so I wanted to give you a chance to respond to that. Um, You've questioned the legitimacy of the vaccines. Um, you once said it was untested and created by eugenicists who want a smaller global population. Um, do you regret using that rhetoric? And has no, your opinion no, I think, changed? I think it's true. If you read Robert Kennedy's book, that's exactly what he said, too. And um, he had researched everything. And what I said was on my own Facebook page, I, I hadn't gotten COVID yet, but I was trying to get my mind around it. Why are we doing this? Why are things shutting down? And it really hurt a lot of small businesses. Why are smaller businesses being shut down, but the larger ones are still allowed to operate? And that didn't seem fair. But I wrote, why would anybody take a vaccine that's not a vaccine? It's more gene therapy. And uh, you, you, uh, it hasn't been tested. I mean, it takes you know years to test these things, but they had their hurry-up thing. And you can't sue for damages if something goes wrong. And then uh, the other thing was there's already alternative treatments available. So in my own experience, I, I had heard ivermectin would work. Well, I couldn't find any that, you know, uh, to buy, so I went and got the what they call the horse dewormer. <laughs> so, I mean, okay, great. They use it for that, but, um, you know, horses eat apples too and sugar cubes. I like those. You know, those are, those are good just because horses use it. In fact, a lot of other livestock do too. Then um, that doesn't mean you're, you're crazy. So as soon as I tried it, you know, I put a little dab on a spoon and I ate a Snickers bar after that and drank some cranberry juice. I felt better almost immediately. And everybody I gave it to um, felt better too, especially the Vietnamese community. I introduced it to them and they all were, all were taking it. And uh, on page 19 of, Fauci, of uh, Kennedy's book, which I think was probably like 500 pages, it says the reason they had to um, demonize ivermectin was because it, if it could be proven there was a natural um, uh, treatment for for COVID, then they didn't need the vaccines. They would have lost, big pharma would have lost billions of dollars. So they had to shut it down and then demonize everybody that was um, you know, purporting for that. But I had six friends um, who died, you know, and it wasn't like they died from the shots so much. They died from the treatment of the shots. They gave them remdesivir which is a lot of doctors will tell you is almost like poison, and they put these respirators on them. 
And, uh, you know, everybody I could get. And the problem was they went to the hospital before I got a hold of them. And then, but people I did get a hold of before they went to the hospital, they, they got better right away. And in fact, there's one province in India which has, like, I think maybe 200 million people. And uh, they had very few cases. I mean, almost like just a handful of cases of um, people dying from the, from the COVID thing because they were all with the cattle uh, part of uh, Hinduism, you know, they, they it was something they were taking all the time. They knew it was good for you. In fact, it was used in a lot of things until the whole, um, the whole COVID thing came up and then the, the uh, mainstreamers started demonizing it. So, in fact, Rachel Maddow had a show and she said, oh, people are rushing to hospitals because they have overdoses of ivermectin. And it turned out it was, you know, people that really need the hospital can't get in because we have all these ivermectin patients. And it wasn't true at all. It was a total lie. But, you know, you have to uh, look at where you're getting your news from. And uh, I think that was a problem. The censorship is, I think, a huge problem. And that's what doctors do. That's part of the scientific method is look at all the alternatives. You know, first, do no harm. Don't rush into something. And I think that um, that's, I worry about our country, that where we're heading. In fact, they're even talking about restricting freedom of speech. We should never do that, you know. This is America. It's we the people, you know. So that's the great thing about our Constitution. That's probably why I'm a Republican. At least, you know, I have problems with my own party, but at least we give lip service to the Constitution. I think the Constitution was the greatest document ever written to rule by. Well, I appreciate you sharing that there. Um, I can't speak to uh, the province in India or the Rachel Maddow report uh, just without seeing it. You know, I do want to clarify, clarify for the voters, while the vaccines did have an expedited process for FDA approval, they did go through clinical testing, three phases of it. Um, kind of refocusing here on the state level, what do you think could have been improved about the state's response to COVID-19? I think the emergency orders, you know, kind of became... Uh, almost a totalitarianistic thing. In fact, uh, when I put that on my Facebook page, uh, Governor Inslee on his own Facebook page uh, wrote, you know, I applaud Facebook for censoring Representative Rob Chase. And I thought, well, we both take a, uh, took an oath to the Constitution. Did you skip the First Amendment, Governor Inslee? And uh, so we, you know, once we start losing, you know, on these basic inalienable rights, then our country it ceases to become the republic that we, we were we were taught in school, you know, that was uh, so wonderful. And I think we're possibly on the way to losing that, depending upon this election, the outcome of this election. They had, um, that Facebook post you mentioned, they had removed that. Facebook had said um, that it was COVID misinformation. Mm -hmm. So they removed it because they're internal policies. Do you believe um, there should be more restrictions on what private companies can allow on their platforms for something like that? You talk about it as a, an attack on free speech. So I'm wondering if, mm -hmm. as a legislator, that would be something you're interested in pursuing. Yeah, I think you, you know, there could be harm, I guess, but then that suddenly forming a police force to do that is actually worse. So I think if you don't like Facebook and what's on it, just don't go to it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Kind of going back to the district here, what do you kind of see as the, the top issues uh, going into this election? What do you hope to focus on, and, and what do you think the district needs to, to see from their representative? I think um, getting back to uh, listening to, to the people, and, and really I don't think this legislature, which is um, totally Democrat, was really listening to the people. They all voted in unison. You never saw them cross lines, and I think the— majority leader, um, you know, ruled with an iron hand. There would be repercussions if they left the, <laughs> left the group, whereas I, I felt like I had more, you know, no one ever told me don't vote this way, you know, or you're going to be in trouble. Uh, and maybe I eventually did. They just kept it because <laughs> I did lose. But, um, uh, and it was kind of like a combination of mainstream Republicans and um, the Democrat. In fact, the lady who's running for Congress now, Carmela Conroy, recommended my opponent, uh, Leonard Christian at that time. So that that hurt, you know, to um, to lose that because I really wanted to accomplish some good things. And, uh, you know, like the property rights, you know, thing that I want to do on partial payments on property. And there are some other things. I was working on a, a bill that would, um, a strategic, strategic stockpile bill where if there was a natural or man-made disaster, we would have put away 
at least a year's worth of uh, commodities and foodstuffs and medicines, and we'd be prepared for it, whether uh, there's an economic crash or whether Mount Rainier went off, you know. So I think, and I get that from the story of Joseph in the Bible. So I have a, uh, a Christian worldview, and one of the bill that really bothered me the most that they passed, and I wasn't there to vote against or speak against it, was um, that one where there's no parental notification on sex changes for your children. And we, when I was out of office, I did work hard to get those initiatives um, going. In fact, when I was in office, it was 11, and I think that was a bridge too far for people to sign 11 initiatives. But then we wouldn't have known we had to um, break it down to six initiatives. That was a more manageable number. And those um, three of them, the Democrats let become law, including the one on parental notification for sex changes. But there's three that are on the ballot this year, and hopefully they'll they'll all uh, pass. And I think that was the biggest thing uh, conservatives have done in the history of the state, I think, those six initiatives by Brian Haywood. And uh, my opponent, you know, two years ago, Leonard Christian, said he thought it was a waste of time. And, uh, <laughs> well, it wasn't. You know, it really turned out to be something big. You just have to—it's um, we the people, and Article One, Section 1 said all power, political power lies in the hands of the people of the state. And uh, I think that's where it should be. And, of course, you can have these elections, and I hope that people get behind me. But, you know, they haven't always. And uh, a lot of it is big money, too. I think there's a lot of big money. Um, with Citizens United, you know, artificial persons can put a ton of money into elections. And that, you know, people, if, if someone has a, a huge majority of the money, that's the way they're going to vote. They're voting for the best advertising company, I think. And that kind of gets away from... Um, finding good representatives. And the other thing, too, along with that, if people are standing out amongst them, I mean, there's the only people that seem to get in trouble anymore are the whistleblowers, like Julian Assange, you know, and uh, um, oh, I forget, several others that I can't think of now. But um, they come after them, even myself, you know. If I was trying to be a whistleblower. I felt like I was a watchman on the wall. And, uh, you know, if you don't warn the people, you're just as guilty as the people attacking your city. <laughs> you know, biblically. On the um, kind of money in, in campaigns, you know, that's something we try to track. You know, we report all PDC filings when we do these election previews. Mm -hmm. um, would you be interested in, in pursuing that at the state level, or do you feel like Citizens United kind of preempts that, and so it's not an avenue you would actively work on legislation? In? Well, I'll tell you, give you an example. Um, and I had gotten into big trouble. I ran for county commissioner, and uh, Shelley O'Quinn had resigned, and then uh, um, one of the commissioners said, well, I'll vote for whoever comes in first place amongst the PCOs. And uh, I thought, well, if I can, uh, I kind of, you know, I thought, well, if, if this guy is true to his word, then um, uh, if I can get a majority of the PCOs behind me, you know, I, I could be county commissioner. Because I take the take, taking a two-term pledge for treasurer, so I need, wanted to run for something. Again, I still wanted to stay engaged, so I ran for commissioner. And I did get the um, a majority of the precinct committee officers, but then um, one commissioner um, voted for me, and one commissioner voted for the second-place person. And then it got deadlocked, time ran out, and it went to Governor Inslee, who picked uh, Mary Cuny <laughs> to be that. But I think one thing that hurt me was I had... Um, a Vista was going to sell out to Hydro One of Canada, and uh, I had a common cause group of people, Republicans and Democrats, some were CPAs, that said if this goes through, looking at the projections, our um, our rates could triple, our electrical rates. So yet the uh, um, the board of a Vista, 13 people were going to split $51 million if it went through, not to mention stockholders, you know, the stock going up. But yet, you know, they'll leave, make their money, but then the rate payers are stuck paying this bill. So I used a little known process called coordination. Not many people know about it, but it comes from the 1970 National Environmental Policy Act and talks about the human environment. Now, the human environment isn't just flora and fauna. It's also like history and architecture, health, and um, but also um, uh, financial, too. And... The, what they should have done, the Securities and Exchange Commission should have coordinated with local officials, and they didn't. They missed that step. So I brought them back to coordinate. Well, coordinate uh, does not mean cooperate. Coordinate, it's almost like veto power. You have, oh, this doesn't look good for us, so we're not going to 
cooperate on this. So that's what I did. Well, then um, I ran against uh, Mary Cuny, and of course, very well off. And I, I think I'd raised twenty thousand. She had raised a hundred thousand dollars, and then um, Avista gave her another hundred thousand dollars in, uh, uh, you know, indirect. So I think that kind of bothered me. You usually don't see something like that happen, but um, I think they wanted to make an example of me. And you know, I've been an Avista company customer for a long time, but it was. Uh, you know, developed by Hydro One of Canada, which is almost part of Maurice Strong, who's well known with Agenda 2030, was one of the, the founders of that, like Uranium One. And there's a lot of reasons I just couldn't see any good. And I felt I had standing as county treasurer to uh, to uh, sue the Securities and Exchange Commission. And of course, you know, I don't, actually only had one good article on me, and uh, that was written by someone I wouldn't have expected at the Spokesman Review. And uh, I can't remember his name now, um, but it, it was it was really nice. So he's so usually would be on the opposite side of me, and he was always uh, getting into it with Matt Shea. I remember, and uh, but I don't know if, if uh, you you I know you're fairly new to this. Yeah, it was probably but, uh, before my time. Yeah, yeah, it was so. Um, but most of the press I got was was bad. This is a frivolous thing. What's he doing? But the guy, my attorney, was from Nampa. I'd always part of the Sagebrush Rebellion. And he actually had never lost using using. It. I mean, it's taken some years to get done, but um, unfortunately, he passed away <laughs> during the thing. So, uh, and then I'd lost my seat, so I had no no more funds to be able to um, to do it. But it fell apart anyway. I think I, I think everyone said, "Don't even try it." So it's a done deal, you know. But you know, I thought, well, let's, let's try it, see what happens. And eventually, the governor, the prime minister of Ontario, stopped the whole thing. I think he found out about it. You know that this would not be good for either party. Yeah, I um, I wanted to touch on public safety. I know it's something that you had um, kind of emphasized in the primary race. Uh, you touted kind of your your voting record when you were in the legislature. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, what would um, be new kind of about this next session? What, how would you hope to advance the efforts of public safety in the district? I'm thinking about Spokane Valley looking to hire more police officers, or even statewide. You know, we lag behind national statistics on officers per capita. So right. as a legislator, no, yeah, as a legislator, what would you hope to do on the public well, safety front? Well, I think front? Um, mental illness is a, becoming a public safety problem. So when I was in the legislature, I voted always to fund uh, uh, that. I mean, a, a policeman, he might get beat up once or twice or maybe a few times in his uh, career, but these <laughs> these uh, people that work in mental health, I mean, sometimes they get beat up once a month sometimes, you know. So um, it was hard to find people that work in that. I think that they, since it's a public safety uh, problem, they should have salaries that are comparable to um, what uh, police are doing. And uh, and that seems to be a growing industry, too, uh, because of all, uh, you know, there's a variety of reasons. But I have a friend, um, Marie Smith, and he used to be a pastor for many years. He lives by me in my apartment complex, and I knew him. He wrote a book. He was a day manager at Camp Oak, and he wrote a book called A Place to Exist. I would recommend it to anybody who wanted to understand it. You know, maybe they're not going to agree with his point of view, but um, I think we're the what we're using for um, uh, homelessness. You know, if you ever saw Grapes of Wrath, that movie with with Henry Fonda, I mean, we're still using. The same tactics. Oh, let's clear the place out. Well, they just go someplace else. That's why his book is called A, a Place to Exist. Uh, and in fact, the sheriff's office was flying helicopters over it, scaring people. And they said, well, why are you doing this? And, well, we want to get accounts. Said, well, everyone's got an ID here. All you had to do is ask us how many people are. We could have told you that. And then there was like a uh, someone, a, a neighbor had just, you know, strung their hose over to the thing. That was the only fresh water they had for a while, and the city disconnected it. So I think the city made some mistakes, and I think all the parties need to gather, get together and say, how do we deal with this? It's probably going to happen again. And uh, then that gets back into the homelessness thing. That's just, and I, I think sometimes something outside of the city or the state is, really affects you badly. But in this case, I think it's a Federal Reserve monkeying around with interest rates and money supplies. And they haven't done a very good job. You know, we never went over a, a trillion dollars in debt until the Reagan administration. And this was after Vietnam and the Great Society and the space race and all that. So we get all these derivatives and uh you know, when when, off, when we went off the gold standard in 1971, well, there's nothing um, uh, 
keeping control of everything because you really couldn't issue any more than you had the amount of gold to pay out. And uh, when they went to the petrodollar, well, how much petroleum? No one knows how much petroleum. So they they just filled everything up with all these IOUs and uh, things got out of control. And now we owe, uh, well, over $35 trillion. And that's just what they admit to. So I think the amount of interest, I think we're we're technically bankrupt in this country. So how are they going to settle that? You know, it's um, it's going to be a big issue, and I think there's going to be a lot of people, one way or the other, are going to get hurt over it. Yeah, and you've long been a, a proponent of returning to the gold standard oh, yeah. in past mm-hmm. elections. Yeah, because it gives you a discipline, I think, you know. Yeah. And that's why people like Bitcoin. There's only, uh, uh, and I am not a Bitcoin expert, but I can understand there's only uh, a finite amount of Bitcoin that are issued. So then the price of Bitcoin, I could have bought it for a dollar, <laughs> a thing, and I just thought this is like nothing. This is like magic beans. You know why would I do that? And uh, of course, I was dead wrong on that. But um, still, I don't know. That might be something uh, that could be manipulated. And I think a lot of money is being hidden there. You know, in that. So we'll see what happens. It seems like it. Um, I kind of want to stick with housing. You had transitioned us into that. Um, one of the things that was kind of batted around for renters before we get into home ownership, I wanted to start with renters, mm-hmm. um, is kind of an annual increase cap um, on rent. Um, I think last year they were floating around 7%. Um, it didn't make it through the legislature, but it might come up again this year. Is that something you would be supportive of? Uh, why or why not? No, I'm against rent controls. You know, you're, you're interfering with Adam Smith's invisible hand. I think free market, if, if it's too expensive here, people will find somewhere else to live. I think that's the best thing. Now, I think a lot of people want to live here. It's a beautiful city with a river running through it and um, there, you know, Mount Spokane. And, uh, but I think people are waiting. You know, Meanwhile, they're building apartments. I live in an apartment now. I sold my house uh, several years ago. But I would like to get a house again. But it's, it's um, up way too much, I think, that, uh, you know, I think— in fact, I saw a home I lived in in Seattle. My dad bought it for $18,000 in 1967. It was like $1.5 million <laughs> now. I mean, how can a young person ever sit, save up the money uh, for that? Well, a lot of people aren't moving because of the zero interest rate policy, getting back to the Federal Reserve again. We had all that quantitative easing and easy money. And now a lot of people, older people, might, might want to find um, a smaller home. But, that's, I mean, there's low interest rates. They can't afford to move out. You know, so then maybe their their kids are living with them, and um, but it, you know, it usually uh, things usually work themselves out if you just leave them alone. I think that will happen. Okay. Um, on the home ownership front, uh, you know, what do you think could be done at the state level to kind of drive down the cost of housing and increase avenues to home ownership for folks? Well, like I said, it's more of a federal problem with the money supplies and and all that, and you know, there's in fact I. Visited my daughter in Little Rock, and um, it was over the summer, and uh, I drove through towns. I mean, lots of nice homes, you know, that would be there that, uh, of course, nobody wants to move. I mean, you get older, you want to know where all the streets are and not a, you know, brand new adventure somewhere else trying to figure out where things are. In fact, even this city is, you know, there's still parts of the city. I've been here since Expo 74 that I suddenly, I, well, I've never been in this neighborhood before. I didn't even know it existed, you know. Uh, I don't know if that's really answering your question. It just takes time. Time yeah. heals a lot of these things, especially if you let uh, nature take its course. And I think there's um, we're just kind of I don't know if we're overbuilding, but I think the time will come. You know, we may regret building all these apartments because the money could have been uh, used for something else. But I think when that happens, I think prices will come down. And then getting back into gold and silver, that's why gold and silver are going up. You know, I was kind of ridiculed. For being on the gold standard, but you know, when I was ridiculed for that, gold was like, um, oh, maybe three hundred dollars an ounce. Well, now it just went up to like twenty six hundred dollars an ounce. I remember I ran for re-election as county treasurer. Uh, the lady who was running against me uh, said, "Well, Rob Chase could have. Um, he was attempted to put the entire investment pool into gold. Well, and I always say, well, first of all, there's no law that allows me to do that. You know, and." Besides, what's wrong with that? Banks own a lot of gold. They usually, keep a lot of gold for things. And um, you know, if I had, we'd have, we'd have been, uh, gosh, in like Flint if we had done something like that. But you know, you, your safe, you have, safety is number one. So you you try to spread out your 
your uh, investments, and mostly you're only allowed to invest in uh, bonds, you know, agencies and treasuries and some state bonds. And uh, now recently they started allowing you to in, uh, invest in some of the big corporation bonds that are probably supposed to be fairly safe too. So with interest rates going up, I think uh, Michael Baumgarten did a lot better than I did as far as the money that came into that. Uh, you know, he's But he was investing like at 3 or 4%. I was, we were hard to get uh, returns above 1%, you know, but we... We actually were number two in the state as far as our investment return, but we always kept safety number one and, and did well. So it's kind of um, uh, uh, you just really have to be careful. There's a Grant County guy that you know went for the the high returns and he almost lost his whole fund, you know, by doing that. Yeah. Well, I, I ask about um, housing at the state level just because when I talk to folks that are in the development industry, you know, they'll point to the state's new building and energy codes as that's driving up the cost of development, and those costs are passed down to um, homeowners. And Well, we got to get all rid of the of red programs. tape, I think, make it a lot simpler to yeah. to buy a house. You know, when you buy a house now, you probably have well over 100 documents that you're signing. And I think when I looked into it, I was going to become a real estate agent when I first came here in the mid-'70s, and it seemed like you didn't need a whole mo- lot more than an um, earnest money agreement, you know. But then you have all this... Um, CO2 regulations and everything. And that's another thing that I think, I think the global warming, I mean, and uh, Ted and I got into this, but, you know, you have to look at the math. You know, there's um, uh, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is like 400 and, uh, 406 parts per million, I think. And of that, only 3% is, is man-made. So if the atmosphere was, say, 60 miles thick, it's only like a last dozen, few dozen feet that are actually man-made CO2, and we need CO2 to live. So I don't understand that. And the second part of that is I calculated uh, the surface area of the state of Washington compared to the surface area of planet Earth, and it's uh, 17 ten-thousandths of 1%. So if we're, we're going to put hardships on all these people to get rid of methane gas and natural gas and all that. You're going to cause a lot of damage and you know, really destroy a lot of people for something that um, doesn't make any sense. It's just a big, great big hoax, I think. Okay. So you think that the state's kind of Climate Commitment Act, you know, has mm-hmm. minimal long-term gains just yeah. comparatively? Mm-hmm. Okay. And I do just want to specify for the voters— um, uh, for the energy codes and building code changes that were made regarding methane gas, it heavily um, emphasizes electrical appliance. It doesn't outlaw um, the usage at all. Mm-hmm. I just want to clear that well, up. Well, methane folks. gas, they're talking about, you know, maybe having less cattle or something. Well, there's less methane gas in the atmosphere than there is, uh, than there is CO2. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, you just, you know, I just, I just, cannot believe that people can't look at the numbers and say this is a, a non-issue. You know, we need to get past that. And, you know, for the amount of money we wasted, we probably could solve the solving, solve the ho- homing, the houseless problems, you know, the, that uh, those needs. And, um, and, of course, federally, you know, the, why I like the state legislature is um, you got a lot of power per the Tenth Amendment. There's a lot of things federal government's doing that shouldn't be doing. There's no constitutional... Uh, reason for it. There's nothing about health, education, or welfare in uh, in the Constitution, but that doesn't keep them out of it. So I think what we need to look at doing, of course, it's the wrong state to do this, but maybe nullifying some of these things that are being handed down. Because getting involved in um, these foreign wars and the Ukraine now and, and everything, gosh, we could have done so much more with that, that money. You know, our treasuries are robbed, and there's going to be... Um, a day of reckoning coming. You um, kind of alluded to it there, but you know the Olympia has been, you know, kind of dominated by the Democrats for a while now. Mm-hmm. And and as a Republican, uh, how do you plan to kind of be an effective legislator if you're elected? Uh, do you hope to reach across the aisle? Oh yeah, um, yeah. I think yeah. there's a lot of common cause issues. A Vista was one, and um, uh, partial payments was another one. So I'm always willing to talk to the other side. On that, for instance, I uh, I was um, uh, asked when I was there before, would you uh, help us to uh, stop uh, mink farms? You know, all these animals do is they bite each other through the cage. You know, I, I hate to see cruelty to animals, so I go for something like that. Well, we are just about out of time, real quick, but I want to get you. Uh, 
I want to get your response to some of your critiques um, that were kind of thrown out by your opponent, Ted Cummings, when he came in for his conversation. Um, and the first one is about the integrity of elections. You've, you've questioned the integrity in past bids for office and, and recently on your social media. Um, could you kind of dive into what your concerns about our election system are? Well, in the year 2000, um, the Democrats were all concerned that uh, Bush had cheated and defeated Gore. <laughs> and uh, there's a book written at that time by a Democrat, and her name was Bev Harris, and it's called Black Box Voting. And she asked, by the time you get to the end of the book, anything plugged into the wall can be hacked. And now with um, uh, Bluetooth, uh, you know, it doesn't even have to be plugged into the wall. So that whatever the truth is, a lot of people really don't feel like their votes are being counted correctly. So I would like to, uh, in fact, there was a lady who was a strong Democrat for a long, long time. She's part of this group that's joining Trump, Naomi Wolf. And uh, um, she sent to the 50 state legislators, here's how you can solve this problem by having a paper trail and going back to the way things were. And uh, maybe you've you got to get it right first before you can experiment on other things. And I agree with that, you know. I, I think people need to feel that their vote is being counted correctly because if you don't, why bother to vote? You know, so that works towards um, whoever the culprits are that are are, uh, are trying to change things. And, uh, you know, I think now that um, it's not just me, but most people I talk to on my side of the aisle don't believe that um, Joe Biden won the 2020 election. How could Joe Biden have uh, gotten 81 million votes and he hardly ever left his basement? I mean, that whole thing looks suspicious. So that's why these people went uh, on January 6th to protest. And we have a right to protest, you know. It's we the people, not we the the bureaucrats, you know. So I don't well, think there is— a protest, uh, yeah. I mean, there were officers that were injured at the Capitol there. Yeah, and... but I think you look into it. See, that's the problem with Ted and I. It's where you get your news from. Ted only watches mainstream news. I watch, I watch mainstream, but I also watch everything else that's on the Internet. And there's people that— um, are truth seekers, that, and there's, uh, you know, we're supposed to have a right to a speedy trial. Well, it's four years, and some of these people are still in jail. And also there's um, other speculation that a lot of those people that were tearing down the barricades um, were uh, uh, undercover FBI agents wearing MAGA hats. And a lot of people believe that, you know. So we're not some crazy, screwy uh, uh, um offset of people were probably 30 or 40 percent of the county, at least, you know, that that are open to things like that. So I think uh, I'm a truth seeker. I've got truth matters on my signs. So that way, if, if I'm wrong, prove me wrong. You know, um, if I'm wrong, then I'm honestly wrong. But I want to, you know, I think truth matters is a good logo and that's what I'm searching for. But a lot of it really depends on where you get your information from. Kind of on that line, do the congressional, you know, hearings that were held on January 6th or the 2020 election or, you know, these state election officials and judges and the prominent Republicans like Georgia Governor Brian Kemp, who've, who've come out and mm -hmm. you know, kind of disavowed uh, these theories about the election, does that move the needle for you at all? Does that influence your, your line of thinking at all? Well, I just don't know. I know people were there and they said... Uh, um, and they're still, they still could be arrested for that. But yet they didn't uh, arrest anybody like in the BLM riots, you know. But they, they kind of go after um, conservatives because they see them as a threat. And I think the main problem uh, Trump did was he got elected. He wasn't, Hillary was supposed to be the anointed one that was going to take over. And, and she wasn't, you know. They, uh, he slipped through and um, they've done nothing but lawfare against him <laughs> The entire time he's been impeached twice. I mean, he's gone through. I mean, I think he probably could afford really good tax lawyers and, and tax accountants, and he kept himself clean. And otherwise, they would have come up with something by now. But they really haven't. And I don't think he's Hitler or anything like that. He's nothing like Hitler. In fact, you know, I think he's. Uh, and I'm not. You know, everybody's got their, um, you know, feet of clay or, or things like that. But nothing arises to the occasion that I could see. But I do see a lot. Uh, people that have been getting away with it. There's a guy named Ray Epps who had FBI connections that was urging everybody to go into the Capitol, and the Capitol Police opened the gates, you know, for them to go in. And uh, I think that's, you know, 
a lot of people, and they never should have shot that lady. The only person that really got killed was that one lady that, you know, he just shot her, you know. I mean, you're supposed to warn them to stand back first. That's what a security guard does. There's no warning at all. So there's, I think there's a lot of things. Hopefully they come to light, and I, I'm hoping uh, Trump uh, does succeed. I'm hoping a lot of, I hope he makes better appointments than he did this time, but um, I, hope, I hope truth will come out, and usually it does eventually, maybe not on our timing, but I think on God's timing. So do you? So when those officials come out and they say these things, you know, when they when they back the results of the election, it it doesn't really impact. Well, I think they were sued in several courts, that? and most of the courts said Trump, who was the candidate, the had no standing. Most of the courts have backed uh, the results. Every single one of the lawsuits mm-hmm. that was filed challenging the results was mm-hmm. was thrown out. Um, yeah, and I was a judge, you know, that uh, threw those out. So I think we need to, um, you know, I, I, I it's just. It's like they're trying, searching uh, for the slightest thing they can to um, keep Trump from getting elected. And one thing that worries me, I don't think either side, we're all so passionate on both sides, that uh, either side is really going to accept defeat. Yeah, I. Um, it seems like we're, it gets more contentious every day. So mm-hmm. I think you're probably right about that. Um, kind of bringing it back to a local level, do you believe our election results here in Spokane County and in the state can be trusted? No. No, despite winning several elections in the past. Here well, in the it depends. It's not an election. A lot of times, it's that there could be selections. It can be manipulated. And in fact, um, uh, I did my own pillow conference at state line uh, when I w- was in office, and uh, just to get to the bottom of it. And I uh, invited um, Captain Seth Keschel, who's a mas- mathematician, who's Army mathematician, um, uh, he estimated there's 300,000 phantom votes in Washington State in the 2020 elections. And then uh, there's Dr. Doug Frank, you know, with all the algorithms that were going through the air that was tracked. And also um, the uh, uh, professor at Arizona State, David Clements, had all three of them speak. So um, I thought it was convincing that, and everybody there agreed with them. So if people don't think we have good elections, you know, well, let's solve that problem. How do we do that? We've got to change how we're voting for people. Maybe go back to the way it was used to. I mean, these um, – and I don't think – by the way, I don't think there's any, ma- any manipulation going on in the auditor's office here. Everyone seems to be doing their job there. I think it can be hacked. There was um, General McInerney who said um, there's two programs the CIA was using. They were called – Hammer and Scorecard, and they were manipulating elections electronically in other countries where they wanted to um, assure a certain outcome. Well, then in around 2010, then they were suddenly allowed to start using that here. And he said that's how uh, manipulation took place in 2020. In 2016, there were some, but they weren't that adept at it yet. So... You're not going to hear this stuff in the mainstream news, you know. So I, I go to uh, uh, Rumble and BitChute and some of the other things for people I respect, you know, because uh, uh, I think, what do they get out of it? They're just going to get ridicule. In fact, there's a lady here, um, uh, I'm trying to remember her name now, that uh, she went to um, Washington, D.C. on her own money and testified about the COVID things being mishandled and uh, all that, and she got fired by WSU. <laughs> what, what you know? And um, you know she can't but publish. She's broke, has no money, and I can't remember. And I was thinking it this morning, but I mean that actually happened. Why would that happen? You know? Why do we? Why are we losing our freedom of speech? Why are we being censored? This is America. That we should we should be, uh, you know. That's why the Constitution is so great. We are in a republic, despite um, despite my opponent saying we're in a democracy. We're in a republic. Every state has formed a republic, guaranteed a republican form of government. And a uh, republic will, uh, it follows the um, uh, people make a decision democratically on what they had, but yet you have these amendments that protect your rights, you know. So those are sacrosanct. You can't do that. That protects the minority people, too, with the rule of law called the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, which I think is the best document 
that's uh, ever been written for government. Now, some people want to have a constitutional convention. I think, I think that would be a huge mistake because we don't have the same uh, type of leadership and self-sacrifice that our founders had. I think it would turn into a huge mess. And if we don't follow the laws we have now, why would we follow any other constitution that they came up with? I believe in the constitution as ratified. Yeah. I um, I just want to make sure that we, we got it clear for the voters here. So it sounds like you would be supportive, uh, as far as elections, to kind of returning to in-person paper ballots. Yeah, I think we need to get it right. Now, some people— And count it. Some okay. people so, said, let's let's use blockchain technology. That's safe. You know, well, I think before we ever get into anything like that, we've got to make sure we have it fixed before we go forward. Mm-hmm. And people should be voting. You know, I believe in get I believe in getting out the vote, but get out the informed vote. And I don't think our schools, our education system has done a very good job. In fact, um, when I, my own story is, you know, I never got in this until my 40s. And then I realized how much I didn't know that I had never been taught in civics class. When I got the Internet, that's what got, that was the main thing that pushed me into, um, you know, running for these things. I realized, man, our, our country is in trouble. You know, I was in Army Reserves in the 70s. And a little bit too young for Vietnam, but I never got called up. And, uh, but it doesn't mean you have to uh, invade Normandy or something to do your duty. Uh, I think every citizen has a duty to uh, make sure that we don't leave a worse world than the one we were born into, to our posterity. Well, just to wrap anything, everything up here today, um, is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't touched on yet uh, that you kind of want to emphasize for the voters? Well, I think I've, I've um, at least... Uh, there's a Freedom Index that comes out from the New American Magazine. And um, when I was in, out of 147 legislators in Washington State, only four people received 100%. Three of them were from the 4th District. That was Senator Mike Padden, Bob McCasin, and myself. The other person was Jesse Young over in Bremerton. Uh, but rating-wise, I mean, um, a lot of the Republicans, I think, fall short on the Freedom Index, which is a measure of the Constitution. And uh, a lot of the Democrats can be very low on it, you know, like 10 or 20 percent sometimes. So if you take an oath to the Constitution, I think you ought to follow it. I mean, the, the, uh, the United States Constitution and the state Constitution, too. Well, Rob, thank you for your time today. I uh, greatly appreciate it. And uh, voters can keep an eye out for our um, election preview coming out for this race uh, and then catch this podcast. And then we also have um, some coverage going back to some of your past races, um, and then the primary as well, if they want to learn more. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Nick. Of course. Thank you.